it's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the BenQ EX2710. As usual for a video review, what you see depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software, depends on the processing done by YouTube, and ultimately it depends on the screen that you're actually viewing the video on, so in no way does it accurately represent what the monitor looks like first hand. There's a written review, which this video is really part of, and you can find a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. This monitor has a 27-inch Full HD, that's 1920 by 1080 resolution, and it uses an IPS-type panel, or more specifically an AHVA, Advanced Hyper Viewing Angle Panel from AU Optronics. Not to be confused with VA, Vertical Alignment, very different technology. It also has a 144Hz refresh rate, and it supports Adaptive Sync, and it has some basic HDR functionality. So in terms of the screen size and the resolution, it doesn't give you a very good pixel density. It's not terrible in that respect. I see some quite exaggerated comments about this kind of thing, like pixels the size of golf balls, huge pixels. That's not true at all. The pixels are still tiny, as there are over 2 million of them on the screen. Of course, the pixel density is nowhere near as tight as, for example, a 2560 by 1440 WQHD model of this kind of size. And it isn't as tight as a 24-inch or so screen of this resolution. But I wouldn't say the difference is dramatic when compared to a 24-inch model of this kind of resolution. It is noticeable. I mean, that's very subjective, and it does depend on your viewing distance and all sorts of other things, of course. But if you really want this kind of screen size, and this is the resolution for you, you like the sound of this monitor, but you're not too sure about the pixel density, I'd say just give it a go. Many people are actually quite happy with this, especially when you're immersed in a game or watching movie content, which is often full HD resolution as well. That really can work quite well on this kind of screen. It also lets you sit a little bit further back. I tend to sit around 70 to 80 centimetres from the screen, and I find it quite immersive, this kind of screen size from that distance. The resolution isn't great for multitasking. This isn't specific to the pixel density, it's just the Full HD resolution in general. So you don't get a massive amount of desktop real estate, and I know some people will actually want to zoom out a bit in their document because you can't get a lot of words on the screen if you've got another window open with other information right next to it. So it might be tempting to just zoom out a little bit. The clarity of text really isn't that good. I mean, if you if you compare to a model with higher pixel density showing this kind of size of text, there's a definite difference there, but it's kind of still usable, I suppose. So not ideal for multitasking by any means, but that's just the resolution, really. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. So this one has a homely or gamery look, if you prefer. So it has a silver-coloured plastic stand base, and it has this orange strip, which looks a little bit perhaps garish in pictures and videos of the monitor. When I'm actually using it, I don't really notice that very much, so I don't really mind. You can't remove it, though. It looks like it might be removable, but it isn't. I mean, if you pull it really hard, maybe you can remove it, but that's basically ripping it off and damaging the monitor, so I wouldn't recommend doing that. The bottom bezel is dark grey with a shiny black plastic BenQ logo in the middle. I say shiny, it doesn't catch the eye, much like the stand really. When you're just using the monitor normally, it isn't really noticeable. There's also an HDRI button there, dedicated HDRI button there, and it has this sort of vinyl effect on the sticker above it. The top and side bezels are dual stage, which means it has a slender panel border that's flush with the rest of the screen, plus a slim hard plastic outer component. The screen surface is what I'd describe as light matte anti-glare. So that means it doesn't offer quite as good glare handling as some matte screen surfaces, some stronger matte screen surfaces. But on the plus side, you get more direct emission of light, so it's better for the vibrancy and clarity potential. And it gives less of a layered appearance in front of the image than some matte screen surfaces. And I'll talk a little bit more about the screen surface when I'm in-game shortly. But just in terms of the glare handling, it's really quite decent. It certainly isn't like a glossy screen surface, and it isn't like a very light matte anti-glare screen surface either. This is a bright room, so you can certainly see some glare, especially when you're at an angle. But when you've got the monitor switched on, light's competing with the light striking the screen surface. I didn't have any issues with it. There's also an underhanging sensor unit, which houses a light sensor that's used for the BI+, Plus, Brightness Intelligence+, Plus, and the HDRI functionality of the monitor. From the side, the screen's fairly slim at the thinnest point, box out centrally where the stand attaches, and you can see the fairly robust included stand. This offers good ergonomic flexibility as well, so you can adjust the height of the monitor. It's currently at its maximum height. You can lower the screen if you prefer. You can also tilt the screen backwards 
and also forwards a little bit. And you can swivel the screen left and right. At the rear, you can see it's mainly matte black plastic. There is a little glossy Mobius logo at the top there, which is the series that the monitor belongs to. There's also this kind of cross pattern of glossy black plastic. So it looks like it's divided into four different sections with glossy black dividers. I'm not a huge fan of glossy black plastic, but when there's just a little bit here and there, and especially when it's at the back of the monitor, I really don't mind too much. You see the OSD controls down there towards the left side. There's a cable tidy loop at the bottom. There's a K-slot. The included stand attaches using a quick release mechanism, so if you just push the button in there, you can remove the included stand easily and attach an alternative 100 by 100 mm VESA compatible solution. The ports face downwards, they're concealed beneath this removable port cover here, so you can just snap that off. And when I say snap, I don't mean break it off and break the monitor, it just comes off quite easily, he says. So just kind of lift it off like that. And then you can see the ports. There's a 3.5mm headphone jack, two HDMI 2.0 ports and DisplayPort 1.2a. So they all support the full functionality of the monitor, HDMI and DisplayPort. 144Hz full HD resolution, adaptive sync as well, so with the HDMI it gives you AMD FreeSync on compatible GPUs and systems. With DisplayPort 1.2a you can use FreeSync or you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. And at the other side there's an AC power input which means it has an internal power converter rather than an external power brick. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm going to talk about contrast using some in-game examples. So this monitor has an IPS type panel. Contrast really isn't its main strength. I measured a contrast ratio of around 1200 to 1 following the adjustments made to my test settings. Or more accurately, I measured 1164 to 1. So this is stronger than some models with IPS type panels. Not quite as good as the strongest performers. So let's just say it's somewhere in the middle, slightly exceeds the specified values. But really this isn't enough to provide a good atmospheric look to dark scenes, especially if you're sitting in a dark room as I am right now. I've adjusted the camera so it's a bit more in line with how your eyes would be. It was a little bit low down just before, but there is something to consider, IPS glow, and all IPS models have this to some degree. This one is pretty average in that respect, really. So you can see it in the video towards the top of the screen, but actually to your eyes from a normal ergonomically correct viewing position, you're going to see it more towards the bottom of the screen, but it does depend how you're sitting. You might see some towards the top as well. but. It's basically a bloom, a haze, so you can see that it eats away at detail, it eats away at atmosphere, and it actually has a sort of cool look towards the bottom left corner, slightly cool. Not, not a strong cool tint or obviously blue or anything like that, but it tends to be warmer towards the right side. So that certainly affects the perceived contrast, and that isn't something which your measured contrast ratios will reflect. What you'd find is that you get shot at whilst you're trying to... Oh, come on, guys. But a good strength of this model, and IPS type panels in general, is gamma consistency. Yes, I did say some detail is lost because of the IPS glow, that's true. But overall, the detail maintenance for dark scenes, subtle dark details, is better than it is on VA or TN models. So with TN models, you get this kind of detail gradient where things are far too masked further up the screen, and that's because the perceived gamma is too high. And lower down the screen, the perceived gamma is much lower, too low, and things look quite washed out, quite flooded, you might say. And that can give you a blocky and banded appearance as well. On VA models, you have the central region of black crush, where things look too blended, and peripherally, you can have too much detail, or it can be kind of more appropriate detail. It depends. On some VA models, it's more extreme, though, towards the very edges. There's far too much detail on some VA models. So... The gamma consistency is nice and strong here, so the detail levels are better maintained. In terms of the brighter content, I did mention that I quite like the screen surface before. Oh, I should have mentioned that. It is a light matte anti-glare screen surface, so it doesn't have an overly grainy look to these lighter shades. And I should also mention that that light is being massively overexposed by the camera. I'll just fix that up. There we are. So anyway, these lighter shades they don't appear overly grainy because of the screen surface. It also has fairly direct emission of light. It's a light matte screen surface. Some matte screen surfaces have more of a layered appearance in front of the image than this one. So 
It's actually quite good in that respect, and it's actually preferable to the 24.5 inch models, and that includes the BenQ EX2510, also the Acer XB253QGP that we looked at a little while ago. So the screen surface on that is medium matte, so it's not as light as this one, it's a little bit grainier as well. So I actually prefer the screen surface on this model to that. I've brightened up the room a bit now just so I'm not sitting in pitch darkness, just to show you that the IPS glow isn't such an issue if you're sitting in more sensible lighting. It is still there, it is still notable, you can still see that the depth of those dark shades isn't fantastic, but it certainly doesn't catch the eye as much as it does if you're sitting in a completely dark room. What I would say is that if you are sitting in a dark room, you like to sit in a mainly dark room, just try and have some light behind your monitor, like a bias light, something like that. It can really help with perceived contrast and really take the edge off the IPS glow and other sort of issues you might perceive with the less than amazing contrast. And actually it can be very helpful with any LCD, regardless of the panel type. I'm now on Legom, legom.nl, the website, and their test for viewing angles. And I'm going to talk about colour reproduction. I like to start off with this section when talking about colour reproduction. It's really good for setting the scene when I'm talking about colour consistency. So the Legom text appears a good blended grey throughout. There isn't any obvious flashes of saturated red or green or anything like that. It does have a little bit of a greenish stripe to the text, but it doesn't have these shifts that you get on models with weaker viewing angle performance. So that all means that the gamma curve has a low viewing angle dependency, as you'd expect from an IPS type panel. The purple block appears a pinkish purple throughout, slightly pinkish purple. It doesn't have any real areas where it's much stronger in terms of its pink hue, and this often appears odd on the video. It kind of looks like it has a weird central region versus the rest, but it doesn't actually have this effect to the eye. The red block, a good consistent red as well. It doesn't have the kind of obvious burnt red appearance in some regions versus others. There's a little bit of that towards the very edges of the screen, but that can really be affected by uniformity as much as it can viewing angle issues. It certainly doesn't have any clear shifts of saturation as you'd see on VA or TN models. The green block appears a good saturated green chartreuse throughout the screen, again very consistent. It doesn't have any areas which are much more strongly yellow than other regions as you'd get with TN and VA models. And the blue block, as usual, that's good consistent royal blue throughout the screen. I'm on Battlefield 5, I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. So the colour consistency is very much a feature when you're gaming as well, the strong colour consistency, so it has this richness that's maintained throughout the screen, and the overall look I like to describe on this model as rich and natural, and that's because the colour gamut doesn't extend too far beyond sRGB. There's a bit of extension in the red to green region, and you can see that in the colour reproduction section of the written review, what I've measured there but it doesn't have a wide gamut, so it doesn't have a sort of obvious strong extension beyond that. So that means things look really largely as the developers intend. There's a little bit of extra saturation in places, but it isn't a strong kind of extra saturation or vibrancy. But when you combine that with the strong color consistency, it does give a good rich look throughout the screen, rich and natural as I like to call it. So the autumnal colours here, sometimes they're brought out really strongly. On wide gamut monitors they look basically far too red. On this one they're more muted, they do have a little bit of a red push, so that's just because of a bit of extension in the colour gamut, but because it is an extreme extension it doesn't look really strongly red. And it's worth noting as well that when you have a colour gamut which extends beyond sRGB, and you're looking at content like this, this is a game under SDR, so that's designed with sRGB in mind. If you've got a wider colour gamut than that, then things do look oversaturated, and they really start diverging from the intended look that the developers have in mind. It isn't the same as you get with a digital saturation boost, so you change the saturation slider in your graphics driver, NVIDIA's digital vibrance control, or a saturation control in the OSD of the monitor, anything like that. What that does is it pulls shades closer to the edge of the gamut without that gamut being expanded, that crushes everything together and it oversaturates lots of shades whilst the most saturated shades remain exactly the same, so that really just gives a cartoonish weird look to things. A wide gamut, or a wider gamut than sRGB, the extra saturation is more natural, it doesn't crush your shade range like that, so you maintain the shade variety. And as I said in this case, it isn't a lot of extension beyond sRGB, just enough to give a little bit of an extra hint of vibrancy. So there's a nice mixture of pastel green shades as well, and some quite nice, rich, lush looking green shades. Not in this particular scene, this isn't really the best example for these lush green shades or anything like that. You can still see some nice variety there. 
but some models with a very wide gamut as well. You, you tend to find that some of the yellowish greens are brought out far too strongly, so the moss here, for example, this has some yellowish greens mixed in with it. On this model, the yellows are brought out just a little bit too strongly. On some monitors with a, with a wider gamut than this, they can actually start to look really quite off, sort of like nuclear fallout or something like that, or nuclear fallout as you'd see on a cartoon or a certain game. So really that detracts from the natural look, whereas on this one it has a sort of deeper green quality to it. The yellow is not really overdone too much, so it's quite natural. The roaring orange flames here as well, they look vibrant, but they don't look completely overdone. So sometimes there's really sort of a very strong reddish orange quality to some of the oranges and the yellows converge on orange, that kind of thing. That doesn't really happen here because the colour gamut is closer to sRGB. Although, I mean, there is a little bit of that happening, I suppose, but it, it isn't such a strong effect. It's enough to just make it look a bit more vivid, a bit more vibrant. If you do want to curtail the vibrancy and you want things to stick closer to sRGB without any real extension beyond that, there is an sRGB mode on the monitor. Change the colour mode to sRGB. This is an sRGB emulation setting and Colour gamut is now mapped close to the sRGB without that extra extension. There's just a little bit of underextension, and you can see that you can actually adjust the brightness, which is nice because with some sRGB emulation settings you can't even do that, which can be a bit of a pain. You can't adjust things like the colour channels or the gamma. As usual, those controls are locked off. But this just curtails the saturation a bit, but as I said, it isn't an extreme amount of overextension beyond sRGB anyway, so this doesn't really have a huge impact on the image as it would on a wide gamut monitor. And some people might prefer just to get rid of that extra saturation. Of course, if you're doing color critical work within the sRGB color space, this could potentially be useful, but really what I'd recommend is fully profiling the monitor using the native gamut if you're using the monitor for colour critical work, that'll give you the best colour accuracy. And really you should be recalibrating the monitor periodically to really maintain that strong colour accuracy because things do change over time. But if you're not able to profile your monitor, you're not using colour aware applications or anything like that, then the sRGB emulation setting can still be useful. And I just put it back to standard mode just for a little quick comparison. Really the video doesn't give you a very good idea of how things really look for the reasons I explained earlier but you might be able to see some slight differences in terms of the vibrancy and saturation levels. I think most people are going to be quite happy with the native gamut though, because it is an extreme extension beyond sRGB, just enough to give a little bit of extra vividness, but overall things look rich and natural. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about the HDR, high dynamic range performance of the monitor. So I've got the monitor running in HDR, the game's running in HDR, and I can talk about some of the benefits and just really just highlight that this is actually a very basic HDR experience on this monitor. Nothing spectacular. One thing it does bring to the table, so I should mention actually first off, it's not VESA Display HDR 400 compliant even, which is the lowest standard which VESA will certify for. So really this is only a very basic HDR experience. As it happens, the backlight luminance does actually meet the standard for VESA Display HDR 400, although there's more to the standard than that. Uh, but, but it's just in terms of the luminance levels, I actually measured around 485 candles per meter squared, so it does exceed that. It's pretty bright. Not that bright by HDR standards by any means, though. So it does kind of give a, a bright look to these brighter shades like this. The problem is, though, that these darker shades don't look deep, don't look atmospheric. You might notice I'm actually sitting in a dark room right now. I'm actually sitting in not a bright room, but it's sort of moderately bright. It certainly isn't pitch black. And you can still see that the, the depth to these dark shades really isn't there. That's because this monitor doesn't offer any local dimming. It doesn't even have dynamic contrast. Actually, it's a bit weird in terms of its luminance control. Under HDR, you can see you can actually adjust the brightness. That's if you've got the colour mode set to HDR, which is the main HDR setting. I'll go through these HDRI settings, which are a little bit different shortly. But the HDR setting, you can't you can't change many things. You can't change things like the colour channels, that kind of thing. A lot of this is greyed out, but you can change the brightness. That's one of the key things you can change. What I would say, though, is that if you reduce this much beyond 100, I mean, obviously reduce this if you're finding it uncomfortable, that's fine but it just kind of takes the edge off those bright shades and actually just makes things look very un-HDR-like. HDR is actually supposed to have very tight control of luminance, so I prefer to keep that on 100, even though it doesn't give a nice atmospheric look. And the monitor doesn't use any dynamic contrast, so it doesn't even dim the backlight. It's still pumping out its full maximum luminance, if that's what you've set it to. 
I actually prefer a bit of dynamic contrast. It can be enhanced with HDR metadata under HDR, and that just makes it a bit more reactive and enhances the precision of the changes it makes and can make them a bit more appropriate. Not everyone likes this kind of thing, but I just find it helps because with dark areas like this, it can give it a bit more of an atmospheric look. And then when, when you're looking at predominantly brighter areas, it can brighten things up. But really under HDR, you should have local dimming, a good amount of local dimming. That really helps with this kind of thing. That's how you do things properly. So those HDR eye modes I mentioned, I'm just going to quickly go through them. I don't actually much like them, so I'm not going to dwell on these too much, but the game HDR eye setting and cinema HDR eye, they actually use this light sensor. They will make adjustments according to not only the image being displayed, but also your ambient lighting in the room. I'm not a great fan of this, I have to say. For this particular scene, actually it does make it look more atmospheric, but that's largely because it has just dimmed the brightness down quite a lot. To get the kind of brightness levels I was talking about before, which really gives more of an HDR-like look to, to the bright areas, really, you would need to have light striking that sensor directly. So you need to be sitting in a bright room or you need to have some light just directly striking the screen and that sensor. Otherwise, it dims things. So the bright shades just don't look HDR-like at all now. Yes, these dimmer shades do look a bit better. The other thing is that the HDR eye settings, they also apply a sharpness filter. I don't much like that. It's not too strong with the game setting, but it's a bit stronger with the cinema setting. These settings also adjust the gamma and they actually eat away at some of the dark detail here. Although things look deeper, they actually have gone a little bit too far the other way, you might say. Another thing is that it changes the color temperature so it's often too blue, too cool. And I don't much like that look either. So the Cinema HDR eye setting, it, it just actually starts to oversaturate things as well. And, and the game setting can do that a bit, but it's, it's largely because of the gamma. As I said, it makes various changes to the gamma. But these greens now look quite off and a bit unnatural, to be honest. I don't like this look. Again, some people might like it. And actually, some of these reddish browns, there's too much red to them. So I don't like these HDR eye settings. It just seems like they're trying to do too much. And HDR is supposed to have a very specific set of parameters which are followed by the monitor. And I don't really think it's right to be sort of going against this. Although you could argue that really this monitor doesn't tick very many boxes under HDR anyway. So whatever, just, just use the setting which looks best to you, I'd say. So back to my preferred setting, which is just basic HDR. It offers 10-bit colour reproduction. That's the same with all of the HDR settings. It's just something which you get under HDR. It's a bonus of HDR. And this improves the nuanced shade variety. So for these dark areas, of course, they don't look atmospheric, but there's still a superior range of very closely matching dark shades. So it improves your nuanced shade variety. And that lifts out details a bit, makes things look more natural in that sense compared to what they look like under SDR. It can also affect your brighter shades, have it have a nice positive impact there, and I'll come on to that very shortly. 10-bit on this monitor, well actually this monitor has an 8-bit panel, so it's using 2-bit dithering stage on the GPU. But I've actually tested a lot of monitors and very specific scenes that you'd expect to show a difference when you're comparing the monitor side dithering versus GPU side dithering on monitors which use one or the other depending on the refresh rate you've got set for bandwidth reasons. It might use GPU dithering rather than monitor side dithering and the differences are honestly very subtle and I think most people even in a side-by-side -side comparison would struggle to see any real difference. So don't stress about this, you still benefit from the 10-bit colour reproduction even if the GPU is doing the dithering. This scene here, I think in a word I'd call it quite disappointing on this monitor under HDR and that's because this scene can really separate out strong and weak HDR performers. Now, I'm not saying this is the worst I've seen this scene. certainly isn't. I've seen it looking a lot worse than this. But again, there's really just a lack of depth for those dark shades. It just doesn't look as it should. Meanwhile, these bright shades don't have amazing pop to them. They, I mean, they do look bright, but by HDR standards, not that bright. And really, you should have effective local dimming, at least effective enough so that this really very bright area there the very bright area there where the sun's streaming out, the glint on the water, that kind of thing, the glint on this waxy leaf, that should really pop. And the surrounding shades should be a lot deeper than they are, which really helps those bright shades stand out nicely, gives a nice atmosphere to the dark shades, and helps these sort of shadow detail distinctions, that kind of thing. You don't get that at all on this model. 
I also mentioned that the 10-bit color reproduction helps for the brighter shades. Indeed it does. It gives you smoother gradients, smoother, more natural progressions for these brighter shades. That is again something which would be enhanced further with proper luminance control, precise luminance control, which this monitor doesn't offer. But you do still benefit a bit from just the 10-bit color reproduction there. Another important part of HDR is the color performance. I've already said that this monitor doesn't offer a color gamut which extends much beyond sRGB. Unfortunately, the developers are actually targeting, well, Rec 2020 as the longer term standard, but really they have a near term goal of DCI-P3 in mind. So you want your monitor under HDR to offer good DCI-P3 coverage. This monitor does not offer that. I'm not gonna beat around the bush here, so to speak. This monitor offers 82% of the DCI-P3 color space. That's what I measured. So it does not offer comprehensive DCI-P3 color space coverage at all. But then again, it doesn't mean it just looks completely washed out or anything like that. It doesn't really work like that. It just means that it doesn't have the range of shades that it should. Some of the very saturated green shades or what should be highly saturated green shades, they don't have the same depth that they would on monitors with a more generous color gamut under HDR, assuming things are mapped correctly as well, because that's also important. These blue flowers here, for example, they don't have the same pop that I've seen on some models. Same for these orange berries here. But I wouldn't really say any of these shades look washed out. Actually, under HDR, sometimes things can go too far the other way, even if the color gamut's supposedly quite good. It just really depends how things are mapped and how the HDR is implemented. So I think BenQ have done a decent job with the color gamut they've got to work with here, but be under no illusion, this isn't how things are supposed to look under HDR either. And because of the lack of local dimming, the unprecise luminance control if you prefer, so all of the backlight just doing one thing at the same time, it actually makes quite a few of these shades look a little bit less saturated than they should for that reason. I wouldn't say they're washed out exactly, but it always has a kind of fuzziness or a filter in front of them because of the universally high brightness, which does just take an edge off the depth. So the dresses here, for example, they kind of just look a bit faded. And again, I'm not saying they look washed out. They kind of still have a rich look to them, but it's just really that the luminance control isn't where it should be to really help in that respect. And actually, if I look at some of these shades, like some of these greens and Laura's skin tone, it actually looks a little bit less saturated than it does under SDR, but I'd say it's actually more accurate and it is a better representation of what the shade should look like. And that's just because of that slight extension beyond sRGB I mentioned natively. Under HDR, that's removed, things are mapped more accurately or can be mapped more accurately because they're not targeting sRGB anymore. So I suppose in that sense, you do get a bit of a benefit um, from HDR in terms of the colour reproduction. But again, I have to stress, this colour gamut is not an HDR colour gamut. So really to wrap up this section, the HDR performance on this monitor, it is not the worst I've seen, but it certainly isn't the best I've seen. It's only a very basic HDR experience. Some people still like to use it from time to time, and it does give a different look to things, and that can be nice for variety and that kind of thing. I'm on Battlefield 5 again, and I'm gonna talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. So this monitor has 144 hertz panel, and I'm running the game at 144 frames a second, so I'm making the most out of that. And this high frame rate, high refresh rate combination brings with it two main advantages. One is that it improves the connected feel, which describes how the game feels, the, the precision, the fluidity when you're interacting with it. The monitor's pumping out 2.4 times as much visual information every second as a 60 hertz monitor, or indeed, as this monitor could be pumping out if it's running at 60 hertz. Another important factor to consider when it comes to connected feel is input lag. This monitor has a good low input lag. I measured under three and a half milliseconds. So that indicates a good low signal delay, which is the main element of input lag you feel. So even sensitive users should be absolutely fine with that aspect of this monitor. The other advantage of the monitor pumping out so much visual information is that it greatly decreases the perceived blur due to eye movement. This is explored on an article all about responsiveness on the website and also summarized in the responsiveness section of the written review. But basically most of the perceived blur you see on a monitor is due to the movement of your own eyes and that's tightly linked to the refresh rate that the display is running at. It's also important to consider pixel responses and this monitor does very well in that respect. So it gives a good solid 144 hertz performance. There aren't really any what I call standout weaknesses, no major weaknesses in pixel responsiveness. 
There are some slight weaknesses to be aware of, but for this scene here, it's largely medium and bright shades, so a few dark shades mixed in, but really the monitor performs these transitions optimally, so there isn't any trailing to speak of caused by slow pixel responses. I mean, there's a little bit in places of what I'd call light powdery trailing, so that really does little to increase perceived blur. It just has a minor effect on that. But it's basically a very small sort of powdery trail left behind things that sticks close to the object, doesn't really catch the eye, and isn't something that most users are even going to notice at all. There is a little bit of overshoot in places. This monitor has adjustable pixel overdrive. It's called AMA, Advanced Motion Acceleration. I'm using that set to one at the moment. You can set that to zero, one, two, or three, and I'll go through this very shortly. But the overshoot is not particularly eye-catching, to be honest. There is some bright halo trailing, which is brighter than the background color. I'll see if I can give you some better examples of that. Um, it's, it's really not widespread overshoot, so it only affects a fairly slim number of pixel transitions, usually where you've got medium shades for the object, and then brighter shades in the background. So this sky here with the structures as the object, the sky in the background, you can see it a bit there. It might not even come out in the camera because it isn't strong overshoot at all, but it just has a little bit of a fringe of this halo trailing, which is brighter than even the, the background shade of the sky. So it can kind of stand out a bit for that reason. Sometimes it has slightly colorful elements as well. So there's a little bit of blue mixed in in places, but again, it's not strong, not eye catching. And it's not something that most users are going to notice when they're just playing the game or even on the desktop either. If you are particularly sensitive to it and you want to get rid of it, that is possible. So if you change AMA to zero, then it disappears. But there is more of this powdery trailing that I was referring to. So in general, there's an increase in perceived blur. This AMA zero setting is actually still quite fast. It's not a slow setting, even at these high refresh rates. So it's something which some users might quite like if they're particularly sensitive to overshoot and you might quite like the balance that it achieves here. But the AMA setting of one is still a little bit faster. You get less of this powdery trailing and the overall perceived blur is just a touch lower. If you can stomach quite a bit more overshoot, you could increase the AMA setting further. You could perhaps use AMA two. And this makes the overshoot a bit more widespread, and it also makes the overshoot quite a bit more noticeable. I'm hoping it'll come out on the camera now. It can be very difficult to actually capture this in the video, but I can see to my eye some very obvious halo trailing, which is quite bright and eye-catching to the left of this in particular. Also a bit of a blue fringe towards the more shadowy bit of wall there. So I find this quite eye-catching. The setting does slightly decrease the perceived blur, but as I mentioned, it's really quite low using AMA of one. So this setting is not something which most users are gonna to want to use, but you know, if you are a competitive gamer and you want every edge you can get, you don't mind a bit of overshoot, then perhaps this setting will appeal to you. There's also an even higher setting. So that's AMA three. The overshoot is now quite a bit stronger and I mean, I'm hoping this will come across on the video because there is a very colourful, bright green fringe to the left of this object now. Really eye-catching. So I, I'm just going to dial it back to AMA1 for the rest of the video now. What I would say is that none of the settings are quite as fast as the Acer XB253 QGP that I looked at at 144Hz. That was really very well optimised. But this AMA1 setting, it doesn't have as much overshoot as the Acer, and it really isn't a million miles away in terms of the pixel responsiveness. Most users wouldn't be able to tell a difference. I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5, the good old beach scene. This has lots of darker shades involved in the transitions, so this can highlight weaknesses on some monitors. This one, again, it does very well here. So with your typical VA model, you're going to have smeary trailing around the flag there, for example, the boat down there. There's nothing like that here, nothing even approaching that. And the makeshift roof up here as well, that can show some clear weaknesses. There's nothing, there are no clear weaknesses here. There are some slight weaknesses again with this powdery trailing, but it remains light. It's not really eye-catching, it's not extreme by any means. 
Perhaps the slowest transition that this monitor performs would be the one up there. This is often ones that monitors can struggle with, even IPS models. So in some IPS models, there would actually be what I would describe as heavy powdery trailing, or extend a bit more from the object, or just generally be bolder than it is here. So this one is a good fast IPS model. No major weaknesses. Again, I'm not saying there are no weaknesses, but they're just minor weaknesses, which most users are not going to notice. Where it says E to pick up a letter as well, this is one of the transitions which is a bit slower on this model, but nothing substantial. And again, if you turn up the AMA setting, I'll just quickly do that. So I've just turned that up to two. It does reduce this powdery trailing. There's actually really nothing to speak of now where it says E to pick up the letter. But there's a little bit of overshoot. It has a kind of slight green fringe around it. And the trailing here is reduced a bit, but also replaced with a bit of overshoot. Not strong overshoot, though. You're probably not going to notice that on the video. But if you are sensitive to overshoot, um, it, you know, it can be a little bit annoying. And there are, again, some more obvious examples, like I showed you before, when you're using AMA2. So I still prefer using AMA1. That's just my preference. I've made a couple of changes. I've changed it back to AMA1. And I've also increased the graphics settings so that my frame rate has dipped a bit. I'm using an RTX 3090 at the moment, so it's actually quite hard at the full HD resolution to get significant dips in frame rate, but I have done my best here. And you will see that the frame rate is now not 144 frames a second. It's dipped, it's sort of close to 130 frames a second. But this monitor has adaptive sync. And that means you don't get tearing and stuttering from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches. So without this technology or variable refresh rate, VRR technology like this, what you'd get is obvious stuttering if you've got VSync enabled, or you'd get obvious tearing if you had VSync disabled. So with adaptive sync, you don't get either issue. And if you're sensitive to those, like I am, it's really nice to have these eliminated. But sensitivity does vary. Not everyone will notice such a difference with adaptive sync. And it works with both AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. So as I said, I'm using an NVIDIA GPU, so I'm using what's called a G-Sync compatible mode. That works absolutely fine on this monitor. And you'll also notice that when you first go into the menu system, it actually shows, well, first of all, it says FreeSync Premium on. A little bit strange. Um, on my AMD GPU, it always says AMD FreeSync Premium on, even if I had it disabled in the driver. So basically it just had to be connected to a compatible GPU and it would say it was on. With my NVIDIA GPU, if I disable G-Sync compatible mode in the driver, then that doesn't say FreeSync on. The other thing is that with my AMD GPU, this always says 144 Hertz or whatever static refresh rate I'd selected. On my NVIDIA GPU, the refresh rate it displays there actually changes depending on the frame rate of the content. It doesn't change in real time, but just when you first enter the bit of the menu that shows it, it will update. On my AMD GPU, it didn't do that. I'm not really sure why. It was definitely working absolutely fine with AMD FreeSync and NVIDIA G-Sync compatible mode. Very similar experience. Slight difference though, is that the floor of operation is different. I'm just gonna increase my graphics settings a little more whilst I'm talking about this, because it uh, seems a bit more appropriate. I've actually turned on a frame rate limiter. It was very difficult to get it to 60 frames a second otherwise, but the game's now running at 60 frames a second. The monitor is running at 60 hertz. As you can see in the OSD, 60, 61 hertz, 60 hertz, you know, just a little bit of rounding either way. And G-Sync compatible mode is doing its thing. It would be exactly the same on FreeSync. It would be doing its thing here. The difference is that for some reason, my NVIDIA GPU, it went down to 38 hertz as the lowest it would go to before turning on something called LFC, low frame rate compensation. Although technically that's an AMD trademark, so it's an LFC-like technology that's used. What it does is it sticks to a multiple of the frame rate with its refresh rate, and that keeps tearing and stuttering at bay. On my AMD GPU, it seemed to be as advertised 48 hertz, where LFC kicked in, 48 frames a second. I don't know why my NVIDIA GPU went all the way down to 38 hertz. I'm just gonna set a custom frame limit to see if I can actually show you that. So I've set it to 36 frames a second, and you'll see it's 72 hertz, so that's the multiple in effect, the LFC-like technology, and that does keep tearing and stuttering at bay, but you have to be aware that when you're at such low frame rates, they are quite horrible to use in terms of the connected feel being really bad and the perceived blur being very strong. That's not something which adaptive sync can rectify. 
low frame rates are still low frame rates, but you do at least get the lack of tearing and stuttering from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches. It's now 38 frames a second. Bear in mind this frame rate limiter isn't perfect, so there'll be a bit of fluctuation either side of that. But hopefully if I go into the menu system, so it's showing 40 hertz. As I said, it does seem to go down to 38 hertz, uh, but 40 hertz. And I have actually noticed sometimes it seems to display below 38 hertz, so it's showing 36 hertz at the moment. I don't know exactly why that is. Um, maybe it's just not quite perfectly accurate, but usually if the content is running below 38 frames a second, it will use the frame to refresh multiplication. Either way, it doesn't have tearing and stuttering. But one thing to be aware of is that when the LFC boundary is crossed, so 48 frames a second, 48 hertz with AMD, 38 hertz, 38 frames a second on my NVIDIA GPU, there is a momentary stuttering. But with my NVIDIA GPU, because there's a lot of what's called low frame rate judder at such low frame rates, this is really masked very well. It's difficult to notice. On my AMD GPU, it's difficult to notice as well. It's not extreme, but if you were frequently passing the boundary, you might notice the stuttering. So just be aware that it isn't a perfectly smooth transition between LFC being used and not used. That isn't specific to this monitor. It's something which always happens with adaptive sync. If you're only occasionally passing the boundary, I wouldn't worry about it. I've got the game running at 60 frames a second again. So the monitor's running at 60 hertz. Something to be aware of is that with adaptive sync active, now again, this isn't specific to this monitor, it's very common, there is an increase in overshoot. The monitor doesn't use variable overdrive, so it doesn't retune things in terms of the overdrive based on the refresh rate. And the voltages required for the overdrive, technically they're different at a lower refresh rate versus a higher refresh rate, so ideally things would be retuned, but they aren't. However, the good news is that there isn't extreme overshoot even now with this monitor running at 60 hertz, 60 frames a second. I know I'm just showing this particular scene, but I, I've observed the trading range as well, which I was showing you earlier. Same thing, there isn't a lot of overshoot, but there is some, so there's some halo trading around the tree, for example. And if you find that bright, you find that eye-catching, Again, my recommendation is just to dial it down to AMA0. As I mentioned earlier, this actually does pretty well, even at high refresh rates, but certainly at these lower refresh rates where the pixel response requirements are lower, it does very well indeed. So you may notice, again, some slight weaknesses in terms of a little bit of extra powder trading in places, but I really stress the slight. It isn't something that most users are going to notice, but if you're sensitive to overshoot, you will definitely appreciate the much lower overshoots with this setting. So really, I would just say, if you're mainly in the double digits, don't be afraid to use AMA0. If you're spending most of your time in the triple digits, or you're not super sensitive to overshoot or anything like that, I think AMA1 is going to be a nice balance. And for completeness, I'm just going to switch it over to AMA2 to show you how things look at 60 hertz there. The overshoot is a lot stronger now. Again, I don't know how this will come across on the video or if it'll be clear in the video, but to my eye, there is some rather eye-catching overshoot. And again, there'll probably be some better examples in that training range scene I showed you earlier. But the, the funny thing is, even this isn't the most extreme overshoot I've seen on adaptive sync. Some models seem to have fairly low overshoot, bit of overshoot, 144 hertz. But when you get down to this level, things become really eye-catching and you absolutely have to change the response time setting or it's really unsightly and horrible. That Acer model I mentioned earlier, running very nicely at 144 hertz, not too much overshoot. If that went down to 60 hertz or so, in fact, even if it went down to 100 hertz, there would be strong overshoot using that same pixel overdrive setting, so you'd have to retune things again. So overall, I think this monitor ticks a lot of boxes when it comes to responsiveness. It has good low input lag, good fast pixel responses. It has some good pixel overdrive settings for a broad range of refresh rates as well. And adaptive sync technology works very well with AMD FreeSync and NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. Just one final thing I'm gonna mention briefly. I'm not gonna show you this on the video, but there's something called blur reduction, which is a strobe backlight setting. That's explored in detail in the written review. It's a much better medium for exploring that kind of setting. All you see in the video is obnoxious flickering. It's not good to look at. It's not useful. You don't see the benefits of the mode, but that is explored in the written review. So definitely check that out. But what I would say is that it's actually one of the better strobe backlight modes I've come across certainly recently. So it's quite usable. 
and it can give you a competitive edge. It can greatly reduce the perceived blur. It does what it says on the tin, blur reduction. So again, just check out that section of the written review if you're interested in that. To wrap up then, in terms of the design of the monitor, it has a bit of a gamery look. You can see that from the stand, and it has what I like to call the Mobius strip at the bottom, that orange strip. That can be something which I think you look at in pictures and videos of the monitor and think, ooh, that's going to be horrible, it's going to be hideous. When you're actually using the monitor, it's not something you really pay much attention to, it isn't something I paid much attention to anyway. It's just a distinctive feature, which is sort of a signature for the Mobius brands, it seems, and whether they'll keep that going forward, I don't know. But I think it would have been nice if you could kind of remove that interchangeable strips or just remove it and just have it sort of plain silver down there. But again, as I said, it's the signature of the brand. So maybe that's not something they wanted to do. The monitor does not have an amazing pixel density, 27 inches, full HD. But I think there's a lot of fear mongering about the full HD experience on a 27 inch screen size. Pixels the size of golf balls, that kind of ridiculous statement. I think this is something which you'd have to see for yourself, but I think most people don't find it as horrible as they think they might, and I don't find the difference absolutely astronomical compared to a 24-inch or so model of this kind of resolution. But really, the main thing this screen size offers is the immersion. It allows you to sit a little bit further back and still get a nice experience as well. The monitor offers good ergonomic flexibility as well. You can adjust the height of the stand, swivel it and tilt it. I found the OSD quite good as well, fairly comprehensive, and it has some quite unique features, and that's actually explored in a separate video, the OSD. We always explore that in a separate video, and that's because there's actually quite a lot to cover in OSDs of monitors, especially ones which are quite comprehensive like this one, so I think it's better to have that in its own video. The contrast performance was really large as I was expecting, better than some IPS type models, slightly weaker than others, moderate amount of IPS glow, again, quite typical for a 27-inch IPS type model. Static contrast isn't amazing, doesn't give you great deep atmospheric experience, that's not what this kind of monitor is about, especially if you're going to be sitting in a dark room, but did offer strong gamma consistency, and I found the screen surface, the light matte anti-glare screen surface, quite agreeable as well. In terms of its colour reproduction, a bit of extension beyond sRGB for a bit of a hint of extra vibrancy, but nothing extreme, it's not a wide gamut monitor, so it doesn't strongly oversaturate shades or anything like that. So this is a look which I like to describe as rich and natural, so it doesn't stray too far from the developer's original intentions, nor does it look washed out. And certainly with the strong colour consistency, meaning that a shade that you see in the middle of the screen is largely the same if you look at that shade towards the edge of the screen. It doesn't have the kind of shifts in saturation you see on VA or TN models. The monitor also supports HDR, high dynamic range, but I use the term supports quite loosely. Having said that, it isn't actually the worst HDR experience I've seen, and actually I've seen some ones which are officially certified as Vesta Display HDR 400, which are worse in some respects than this model. So I think BenQ have actually tuned things quite well, in terms of the HDR, using the main HDR setting. I didn't think much of the HDR eye setting. I don't think having the monitor adjusting lots of stuff under HDR based on the room lighting or the image, aside from the metadata that the HDR is looking at, really makes much sense. But, you know, that's what they decided to do with the HDR eye settings. It isn't for me. Some people might quite like these settings. That's fine. You know, there are options. You can use them. The main HDR setting, though, I found it... Fairly well balanced in terms of the colours, but not HDR-like in terms of the colours because the colour gamut is just far too restrictive. Nowhere near DCI-P3, let alone Rec 2020. 10-bit colour reproduction was still used in the pipeline, wasn't used on the monitor itself, but GPU dithering was used to good effect. And this helped increase the nuanced shade variety, worked for darker shades and brighter shades. The monitor got fairly bright under HDR, just shy of 500 candles per meter squared. But this is universal brightness. There's no local dimming. There isn't even dynamic contrast. So this didn't really give a very nice look at all to darker content. And really the peak luminance is not great by HDR standards. And when you're not having local dimmings, you're not having those bright shades sort of really pop as being a lot brighter than surrounding dark shades. It doesn't really have the proper HDR-like look. The monitor performed well in terms of responsiveness overall, good low input lag, rapid pixel responses overall, good flexible pixel overdrive settings as well, although I think most users would be quite happy setting this to 1 or perhaps 0 if they're particularly sensitive to overshoot. And the nice thing as well is that Adaptive Sync worked, did its thing, and it worked well on NVIDIA, on my NVIDIA GPU using G-Sync compatible mode, also on my AMD GPU using AMD FreeSync. 
you know, I didn't have issues with flickering. I didn't have issues with screen blanking, which I you can get on some models. And actually, with my NVIDIA GPU, to my surprise, the floor of operation was a little bit lower. But either way, LFC on LFC-like technologies used, and that meant that the effective range of operation for FreeSync was very high, or, or G-Sync compatible mode. And unlike some adaptive sync monitors, the monitor didn't have horrendous levels of overshoot as your refresh rate dipped due to a drop in frame rate when you're using adaptive sync. And I think most users would actually find just sticking to AMA1 fine. If not, again, there's that AMA0 setting. And any weaknesses there were in terms of pixel responses, they were on the minor side, the, the sort of most users won't actually notice them side. So yeah, I do think there's a lot to praise about this monitor. I think it is a nice option. And there is, of course, a 24.5 inch alternative, the EX2510. So if you like the sound of this monitor, you really like the sound of this monitor, but you, you just feel that the screen size is not quite for you, the pixel density, you'd like that to be just a little bit higher and you're happy with a slightly smaller screen, absolutely, I would recommend the EX2510 as an alternative. It isn't a monitor I've used myself, but I have looked at a lot of feedback on the monitor and I'm quite confident that, you know, there's a lot of crossover between the two monitors in terms of the performance. So a lot of what you see on this video and what I, what I praise with this monitor or slight weaknesses with this monitor, a lot of that applies to the EX2510 as well. So that's really all there is to the BenQ EX2710. Be sure to check out the full review on pcmonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.